So I would like to introduce uh, Salim Tamari, uh, who is working and collaborating with the Institute of Palestinian Studies, but is also a professor at the University of Birzeit. And Salim, uh, where I read someone, uh, is uh, mentioned to be the most important historical sociologist in Palestine. Do you remember who named you like not, that? Not believe what you read. Not believe like that. Okay, and I turn the voice to uh, Salim. Uh, go ahead with your thank presentation you. and thank you for thank you uh, accepting it. Thank you, Ira. Ika, and thank you for the residency, for such a wonderful visit I, and good I loving you care. I should ask you with the microphone because we are recording the lecture so that it will be online on our uh, platform. So you want me to thank you again? No, 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 no. I want to talk you uh, through okay. the microphone so our colleagues can okay. and also... Uh, so do we start or we wait for the others to come? <laughs> No, no, we'll wait three minutes. Is that okay? No, because they're on their way. Because everyone knows how we are working. So maybe I will tell you the framework of the whole project and like this Palestinian initiative uh, that we have here uh, as we are waking. So everything started with, um, with the residences actually. This is a first chapter of this polymorphic project that I am dealing with. Uh, I'm running at Wiazdowski a, a residency program already like for 19 years, I think. Uh, no, less, 17 years. And, um, and we started to collaborate with the city of Ramallah on exchanges. A uh, couple of Polish artists were visiting Palestine uh, before. And uh, now we are hosting two Palestinians here for th with three months long residencies. And uh, the residencies we are consciously using as a tool for creating a community of people who can uh, exchange, who are curious about each other, who can like collectively uh, collectively uh, learn the things and uh, yeah and the tool is used by us I mean my team uh, in a very conscious way now we have the first public part of the project which is this assembly and like over those three days yesterday we've started uh, with the with Sandy Hila's uh, lecture uh, about uh, permanent temporariness and uh, the discussion as well, tomorrow we will be dealing with the divisions of the space and like learning from the Palestine. Um, and uh, the next year we are aiming to organize an exhibition which will be like uh, putting on the table in the public all those discussions that happen over this, uh, this period of time. And it's the, the project is uh, under the title Everyday Forms of Resistance, which uh, on one hand, it's like affirmation of all the uh, everyday gestures which we found very important in Palestine, like uh, being together, being hospitable, uh, like cooking, cultivating nature. So the, this is a starting point for us to, uh, to think about uh, issues which we find uh, important. So, uh, yeah, so this is more or less the framework. And, uh, we are we created a kind of a small platform of the institutions uh, which collaborate like with uh, you have here from HIAP from Helsinki we are hosting uh, who is also hosting residents from Palestine and Air and Ferpen that's an institution uh, in Belgium they are also running a residences here we we as Doski and city of Ramallah uh, that's tries within this project is to establish uh, their residency. So, so they think this is also a good tool for them to work on the, uh, on, on, on the project, on like building up an awareness and like making people come, but not only with the touristic visit, but for a longer period of time and like trying to um, create the relations which are possible when you are inhabiting a certain place. Because when you have an institution in the back and when you are like uh, having a home, even if it's temporary home, you probably have a chance to create a different kind of relations. So this is like this network of, of, of institutions that is collaborating with us. And uh, yeah, and a long list of 
collaborators who are like jumping in the project, uh, like uh, Notes and Foundation Benzmiana, uh, with Bogna Świętowska, who, who is like just published uh, one of the editions um, of Notes with um, with uh, photo uh, series from Palestine and with articles in interview with Karolina Grzywnowicz, who is at the moment our res uh, our resident but she she was traveling also to palestine so there are like those different notions that uh, make us thinking about the thing. and i think let's start maybe thank you thank can you. i sit down is that all right yeah okay thank you uh, thank you again Ika, and thank you for the center for contemporary art for inviting me here the subject of my talk is uh, peasant resistance in the context of um, the Ottoman land reform and the, cre the dissolution of the communal land known as Mushar in Arabic and the creation of estates which led to major displacement uh, of peasants. Uh, the theme is inspired in my head by an investigation I'm currently doing of a murder mystery. It's the case of the killing of a German um, entrepreneur called Peter Bergheim in 1891 by a number of peasants in the village of Abu Shusha in the Ramla district. And his killing was associated with the alienation of land from the peasants by the Bergheim family, a family of bankers, German, Prussian, bankers. They acquired the land by subterfuge, meaning they used the indebtedness of the peasants to the government and they covered the debts in return for the farmers signing off their own land in the name of the Bergheim banking family. So after a while the peasants discovered this and on a dark night they killed him uh, on his way from Jaffa to uh, Ramla. I will be talking more about this case, but the point is, this is a very interesting criminal case which was covered extensively by the newly established criminal court of Jaffa, because until the 1870s, uh, Ottoman sh uh, Sharia law was practicing, and now we have a new civil law of investigation which has criminal procedure and I will be talking more about it. I mention this case because it's one of the earliest cases of clashes between settlers and peasants over the issue of land displacement. And it's the beginning of a series of peasant rebellions that reverberated and reached its zenith in the 1936 uh, Arab rebellion in Palestine. So it combines oral history, it combines investigation in uh, police interrogation uh, methods, uh, the land reform, land alienation, settlements, and peasant resistance. All of these combine in the case of the killing of Peter Bergheim in 1891. And when Ika called me and asked me to participate in this a conference which is about uh, quotidian resistance. I didn't think it's related, but uh, she pressed on and I thought maybe we can produce something interesting doing social history and how it can be reconstructed in terms of artistic articulation. So this is, and I, I'm not sure I will succeed, but if I bore you too much, just shake your head and I will <laughs> stop. Okay, so the summary of my talk is this. We're talking about the liquidation of communal land uh, which has been cropped for centuries by Syrian, Lebanese, and Palestinian farmers as well as Anatolian peasants under the Ottomans in the form of what is known as communal land or musha. Musha is a distribution of village land uh, on an uh, annual uh, cycle of cropping by villagers who possess the land in common. 
and the government usually um, taxes this common land through um, uh, feudal lords who uh, pay the tithe uh, to the government and then take one third of the proceeds from the peasants. So it's a very traditional form of exploitative land holding, but it was kept running until the Ottoman land reform in 1858, which began to privatize communal land. And this is the beginning of a major process of alienation and the creation of absentee landlords, settlement activities that led to immense confrontation between landlords and peasants and between settlers and peasants. So the liquidation of Moshe land, communal land, began in earnest in the 1870s, uh, although the law goes back to 1858. And one of the main features of this process was the control by absentee landlords of the land who have now possessed the land and transferred it in their names. It's also the process by which settlers of various European nationalities, including later Jewish uh, Zionist settlers, began to purchase land from the absentee landlords and thus further alienating the land from the farmers. Although not all cases of settlement activity, for example, the German Templars who owned major tracts of land near Jaffa, near the Sea of Galilee in Haifa, used the land by local farmers. So it's only few uh, settler activities involved displacement of the peasants from their land. In most cases, the peasants became sharecroppers on their own land. So this was one major consequence of the alienation of land after 1858. Now, we have to divide in our understanding of this process of land alienation between highland uh, peasants and coastal and plains peasants. Because in the highlands, most peasants actually registered the land in their own names or in the names of their elders. It's only in the coastal region of Palestine, and this happened also in Syria and Lebanon, began to register the land in the name of uh, absentee landlords or the landlords who moved to the cities who in turn sell, sold the land to settlers. And one consequence of this is a series of rebellion which began in the mid-century against the issue of land displacement. This is the context of my talk. Now, uh, the Middle East in general saw a number of peasant uh, resistance to outside invaders as well as to local landers beginning with the Napoleonic invasion, but reaching its zenith in the coming of uh, the army of Muhammad Ali Pasha in 1831 to Syria. Muhammad Ali was in conflict with the Ottoman state, and he sent an army through his son, his eldest son, Brahim Pasha, in 1831, and occupied Syria, including Palestine, between 1831 and 41. And he began a number of administrative reforms one of which was the excessive use of uh, corvée labor. So not all land reform was actually uh, in favor of uh, progressive land legislation. Involved excessive taxation, uh, corvée labor by peasants in the, in the Egyptian army, but also uh, conscription by peasants. And this was a major source of resistance and rebellion against the Egyptians. So we see a number of rebellions which began in earnest in 1834 and continued until 1840 against the army of Ibrahim Pasha and the Egyptians. So uh, this was the first modern insurrections that led eventually to the uh, rebellion of 1936 in Palestine. And what is interesting in this period is how European perception of local peasants began to take a form of demonization 
uh, which is epitomized in this photo by John McGregor in a visit to Palestine. There's a mistake here. It should be 1868, not 1968. And it reflects European fears of local Arabs who were seen as primitive, uncontrollable peasants and Bedouins. Uh, so this is an image from... Um, Although photography existed, but this is a painting of Hula peasants and Bedouins rebelling against um, European uh, visitors and farmers. And it also um, ref is reflected in a very famous book by Mark Twain called Innocence Abroad, where he shows the local um, farmers as being very primitive and dangerous. Uh, Innocence Abroad is some important book to read because it shows how the American satirical writer saw the natives in a very um, acute orientalist eyes. And he, it's, it's a very funny book because it makes a great deal of satire on the so-called holy land, They're calling it extremely unholy. This is Innocence Abroad. What is um, peculiar, not peculiar, but what is noticeable about peasant resistance in this period is the lack of social agenda, meaning that many of these rebellions were either against conscription, against taxes, against corvée labor, uh, but they were always allied with one feudal lord against the state or one feudal lord against another. For example, the great uh, peasant rebellion of 1843, led by Qasim al-Ahmad, was led against other feudal lords in the Ottoman administration, um, especially the Tukans and the Abdul Hadis of the Nablus and Jenin period. Uh, only with the rebellion of 1936, we begin to see some kind of social agenda uh, which made agrarian demands against landlords and the nationalist leadership. We speak here of three major peasant rebellions in the modern era in Palestine. There is the um, peasant rebellion of 1843-44 led by Qasim al-Ahmad, the very important peasant revolt which was part of an urban rural revolt of 1936 39, which began as an insurrection by a religious sheikh from Haifa, originally from Syria, known as Azzuddin al Qassam. And finally, we have the Intifada of 18, 1987, which involved rural and urban activists uh, led by the United National Leadership of the Intifada and making substantial. Uh, um, demands for the betterment of the farmer, but was basically a political insurrection against Israeli rule and against taxation. So, um, there's some detail here about the 43 Qasim al-Ahmed rebellion. What is quite peculiar is that there's only one successful peasant rebellion in the modern Middle East, which is the rebellion of Tanya Shaheen in 1859 against the feudal lords of the Druze and the Maronites in Mount Lebanon. It was led by a, a farmer known as Tanya Shaheen, and he established for two years the free communal republic of Kisrawan. This is often forgotten in modern history, that this was a peasant republic uh, established in Mount Lebanon against uh, Druze and Maronite feudal lords. It was crushed in 1861 by the onset of civil war in Mount Lebanon and in Syria. So it lasted only for two years, and it's a very interesting experiment in which uh, corvée labor was abolished, the land uh, uh, repossessed was given back to the peasants, and a, a sort of mountain citizenship by, was given by uh, Tanis Shaheen and his aides uh, to the farmers. The case I began 
to discuss with you involves the murder of Peter Bergheim, the son of Melville Bergheim, in 1891 by uh, the villagers of Abu Shushi, which is a small village in um, uh, Ramli. Uh, Abu Shushi is a village which exists near Gezer, which is an archaeological site marking the boundary of the Philistine lands in biblical periods, separating them from the Israelite lands. So it's symbolically very interesting um, historical precedent. And uh, Peter Bergheim was, uh, came from a banking family that acquired land in Abu Shushi through subterfuge by making the villagers sign uh, the land in the name of the Bergheim family uh, against the payment of tax areas by the banking family to the Ottoman government. So three years later, the villagers were not able to pay back the interest on, on the loan and the Bergheims uh, confiscated the land. The, the, this was a newly established land law, so the peasants did not understand how somebody giving them a loan can actually acquire the land by contract. And the court system sided with the banking families. So there was immense rage in um, Abu Shushi against the, the German uh, settlers, and uh, they decided to finish him. And what we have is court records, very detailed. I have 280 pages of interrogation by the Ottoman police in Jaffa of the villages of Bushushi about the circumstances of the murder. And it reads for very exciting stuff because they were using modern interrogation techniques Occasionally they beat up the suspects, when, but they put it between quotation. We had to beat him up to get the confession. So it was seen as semi-legal form of uh, extraction of uh, data. And what is interesting is that uh, we have this extensive records of interrogation, summary of the data by the public district attorney, which was a new position, and the court proceedings themselves and the indictment at the end. So what is exciting about this is the claims that the peasants made against the family in the interrogation without admitting their guilt. And they finally, by forsenic, uh, forsenic evidence, they found that the gun, which was in the possession of the carriage driver, matched the um, gunpowder because he shot him in the face uh, of uh, Peter Bergheim's uh, body. So they took them to court. They indicted them. Uh, they, they found four of the villagers guilty. And they got uh, relatively light sentences. They got 12 years, eight years and five years. And one reason they got life sentences is because the, this was the beginning of Jara'im uh, al-Sharaf, uh, or honor killing, because uh, Peter Bergheim had a woman from the village serving him, and there was allusions which the um, district attorney accepted that he was sleeping with her. So the villagers' blood was boiling because the honor of this woman was tarnished. So uh, they used the uh, accentuating circumstances for giving lower sentences to the villages. But the main issue was that the court sided with the Bergheim family on the question of land disputes. The land was eventually given to the father of Peter Bergheim, who was the head of the banking family, and he began to dispose of the land by selling parts of it to the Jewish agency and the Karen Kayamet Israel, which is the land authority of, um, the, uh, uh, of, the, of the Zionist uh, movement in Palestine. 
So by the, the court took about 28 years to be resolved, it was mitigated, uh, followed up. So by the 1920, the court decided that the Karen Kayemet should take the land. So the court systematically, both in the mandate period and in the Ottoman period, uh, ruled against the peasants, although they lowered their uh, case uh, for having killed Peter Bergheim. So I would suggest, and this is research in progress, that the Abu Shusha case was a prelude to the 1936 rebellion in the sense that it was a process of land alienation by which settlers, German, British, even American, but most importantly later was Jewish Zionist settlers acquired land which was released to the public as a public commodity by the land law of 1858 for purchase, alienating the peasants from their land. First by making them sharecroppers and second by, and this is very crucial, by displacement. Because the Zionists, unlike the German Templars for example, did not exploit the peasants who came under their control. They wanted the land for Jewish settlement. So they began a process of displacement, which began in Wadi al-Hawarith and in, um, in uh, Abu Shusha before that, but mainly in, in Wadi al-Hawarith in the 1920s, and eventually led to substantial amount of displacement of peasants. And this was a major source of rebellion in 19. 36, that is the dispossession of peasants from their land. And Abu Shusha was a test case, if you want, or a prelude, or a, 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 perhaps a, a burst of things to come. What is peculiar about um, Zionist land purchases, as I said, was the concept of Hebrew labor. Hebrew labor meant that within the Jewish agency and the, uh, the Zionist land authority, the idea was that you don't acquire land with the farmers on it. We acquire land in order to settle um, uh, Jewish uh, settlers. Uh, of course, not all Jewish uh, lands uh, settlements involved displacement. For example, in Zichron Yaakov, which belonged to the um, British banking family, the Rothschilds, the Rothschilds acquired substantial amount of land in the north, but used Arab labor to produce uh, grapes for the uh, Zichron Yaakov wineries. So not all Jewish farms actually involved displacement, but the Zionist ones did. And the, co the notion of Hebrew labor was very significant in this process of displacement. Am I speaking too fast for the... Uh, okay? All right. <coughs> uh, the, the case... Hmm? Yeah. Yes, that's a good question. I'm coming to that in a minute. So just give me a second. I, I'll, I'll come to that. You mean who were the interrogators, the judges, the public attorney? Yeah. Yeah. They were Turks and Arabs, but mostly Arabs, not necessarily Palestinians. I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. So the material we have, and this is interesting for reconstructing the case, for investigating this case is one, village elders telling the story. And what is really exciting for the case of Abu Shusha and few other villages, but Abu Shusha is exceptional, is the ability of villagers to retain in their collective memory the narratives about the process of acquisition of land by the Bergheim family. This began in 1875. So, Generation after generation, they knew exactly how much land was repossessed by the Bergheims, 
what sort of fights and debates happened. But most interesting, they knew, for example, one of my chief informants is Maha Bushushe, who is a friend of uh, Khaldun. Uh, she is the great granddaughter of the man who killed uh, Bergheim. And she knew in detail the name of the woman, her relationship with Bergheim, uh, what happened on the carriage road from Jaffa to Ramle, uh, how he was killed, it's all retained in the public memory, and the detail is astonishing. And so one thing that I am uh, interested in is to compare these oral historical um, um, uh, records with the interrogation records from the Ottoman court system. And there's a great deal of substantial divergences between them, but there's more overlap between them that is astonishing. So we have the oral history records, but we also have ballads and folk songs. For example, the work of the balladeer Noah Ibrahim, who sings about peasant rebellions from the 1930s. And he himself was a, a rebel, but very important um, a folk, folk song balladeer. And uh, much of his uh, repertoire is still available from that period. And he sings about individual peasants who were involved with the rebellion and what happened to them. We have the Tapu land records. We have the Nizamiya court records, which have replaced the Islamic Sharia records. We have substantial amount of police interrogation records. I found it astonishing how detailed, and I'll show you a, a sample from them, of the interrogation records. And we have the charge sheets by the office of the uh, general prosecutor. We also have, because this involves German, Prussian citizens, uh, consular reports, British consular reports, German consular reports, which kept detailed knowledge about the land disputes, the murder case, and the consequences in the court. This is uh, Melville Bergheim, the father, and this is the uh, ruins of Abu Shushe, which was of archaeological interest. And this is the charge sheet by the uh, Office of Public Attorney or the uh, District Attorney in Jaffa. And this is the uh, interrogation records from uh, 1301, this is the Ottoman uh, calendar, 1301. And this is the judgment of the Court of Appeals, the NAF Court of Appeal. You ask me what nationality the uh, people were. All the judges actually were uh, Palestinians. There was one Syrian among them. The interrogators were both Turks and Arabs. Uh, some of the interrogation records are in Turkish, in Ottoman Turkish, but about 70% of it is in Arabic. And they reproduce the dialect of the peasants in the records. So they're extremely interesting for linguistic reasons to observe. So we know from their um, names Kamil Afandi Sulh actually is Lebanese judge. Salim Afandi Al-Omari is Palestinian. Habib Afandi Dawood is also Palestinian. And we have the name of the court recorder who actually, uh, they would be called today stenographers. I don't think we have stenographers anymore, right? Because we have taped uh, records. Okay, so... This is the map showing the dissolution of the communal land of Abu Shushi. And this is where Abu Shushi is in the coastal plains of Palestine. This is a, an ad by the um, uh, Karen Kaimetli Israel of the first Anglo-Jewish settlement in Gezer, which is the land acquired by the Jewish agency from the Abu Shushi uh, people through Bergheim. And this is actually a record of the um, 
villagers of their own memory of what happened with the Bergheim family. And I compare this with the interrogation records from the Ottoman court record. So, yeah, that's enough. I'm going to conclude now. What are the one to make of this case of an early peasant rebellion, if we call it a rebellion, because actually it was a murder case that I called a rebellion, and I tried to deduce something from it. At the cultural level, uh, it inspired a great deal of folk songs which are often narrated in political rallies, but also in uh, wedding people actually uh, uh, reproduce these folk records, the most important of which is the repertoire of a man called Noah Ibrahim, who is like a collective musical uh, repertoire of peasant lore. We also have the example of these peasant rebellions in how rural mobilization took place in modern times primarily during the first intifada when local committees were established and they had to deal with land committees, disputes among farmers, education among rural folk and so on. So they reverberated with these early rebellions of the peasants. Uh, most important was how the land case of 1858 and the murder of Bergheim in 1891 was the beginning of a process of land alienation which continues until today through the acquisition of land by uh, the State of Israel following the, the Karen Kayamitle Israel and is still a burning issue of land possession in the occupied territories. So the echo of which is still living with us, it's not history anymore or it's not exclusively history. And finally, uh, we have a very interesting methodological issue is how we can use oral history as a window to understand the past. Palestinians are uh, blessed or they are actually damned, they're not blessed by the absence of official archival records. So oral history is a major source which allows people to interpret, classify, and understand the past as an alternative way of seeing things in historical research. Uh, of course, oral history has its own biases and problems, but in this case, it's a very important depository of public wisdom. And if we use it carefully against other archival records, I think we come out with very original ways of understanding history. Thank you. Hey, my name is Timo. Well, this is very loud. Um, uh, so I, I've read some, I know some of this material, not, not this material, of course, but um, I read in uh, Ted Swedenberg's book about, there is a sh short mention that during the 36-39, during the there were independent, co independent Islamic courts running in Palestine. And I really wonder, like, who were running them? Who were these people? Because they, what, what he said was that they had disconnected themselves completely from the mandate government and that they were running a government, essentially, independent from the mandate. And I would like to know a bit uh, if, if there are any, are, are these, because in his book he says that the British confiscated all the papers. So I assume that there must have been some papers, if he can say that there were papers, and if these papers are known, or, or if there is any information about these things. I'm sorry. Uh, there were two um, 
The question is about uh, revolutionary courts established by the rebellion of 36. And now we know more about it than 10 or 15 years ago, because some of these came out from um, uh, written archival records that were not available then. Some came from uh, British police records which were confiscated from rebels. They were, the two sets were run by uh, the Arab uh, Liberation, uh, Jaysh al Inqaz, the Liberation Army, uh, which was in the north, uh, led by Fawzi al Qawqji, and the second by a group called Jihad al Muqaddas, the Holy Struggle Command, by a man called Abdul Qadir al Husseini. They both had revolutionary courts to settle local disputes among peasants. And they used uh, extra legal justice, like when they felt people were wronged, they either, medi they mostly mediated these, and sometimes, but they, they used uh, summary justice. In other words, they, ho they heard both cases and they resolved it. These courts actually were quite sophisticated in the sense that they used local people with legal knowledge. But sometimes army commanders in the field used it. They were not always um, fair, but they are very important because they created a justice system outside the colonial government control. I'm not sure which book you referred to about uh, is. Uh, Ted Swedenberg, yeah. because now we have um, two new books uh, which uh, tell us more about these cases uh, that I can uh, mention to you later. Yeah. So does it mean that there, um, these courts were some kind of manifestation of free Palestinian nation or um, go governance or, or re yeah, representation of the, of the country? You mean these courts? Or yeah, the, the or my question maybe is more, yeah, I, w I was referring to these courts, but uh, um, it, my question is more, may maybe, uh, excuse my ignorance, I might not know, but um, from what I know, there was Mm, there is an argument that Palestinian state never existed, like in a, in a shape of a country. I don't know if that's true or not. So maybe that's the question, if it existed or and when, if it did. Well, for the period I spoke about, uh, Palestine was a region within Ottoman Syria. Uh, there was a country called Palestine under the Ottomans existing from the um, uh, Jaffa until Rafah, which is the uh, Mutasarriflik of Jerusalem. The, 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 uh, the, not the district, but uh, the province of Jerusalem in Ottoman parlance and in popular parlance was called Palestine, Palestine. In 1843, uh, the Ottoman government, after the liberation of, or maybe the liquidation of the British army, uh, the, of the Egyptian army from Syria, preempting the possibility that the European powers, especially Britain, France, and Italy, and to some extent Russia, were going to intervene in Ottoman Syria under the rubric of protecting the Holy Land. They established a state which they called Palestine, and it lasted for six months only, from 1843 until the end of 1843, under a man called Suraya Pasha. And that state was extending from Sur, from southern Lebanon, all the way to the Sinai Peninsula. They decided later to divide, redivide it again. But so Palestine was a name used in geographic terms to refer to a very amorphous region, 
which was southern Syria. There was no state called Palestine, except in the early Islamic period, uh, in the Ottoman and Abbasid period, when, uh, sorry, the Umayyad and Abbasid period, when the Islamic army established Jund Philistin, the district of Palestine, and it more or less corresponded to modern Palestine, and the capital of this uh, country was Ramli. Ramli was the capital of Palestine, yeah. I know some of you come from Ramli, so you should be proud of this. Yeah. So to answer your question, Palestine was a region, but not an administering uh, position. Of course, the Romans had Palestina Prima and Palestina Secunda. The, uh, all the Islamic uh, dynasties had a region called Palestine, but was not administratively bounded, except in the uh, uh, Umayyad and Abbasid period. So it was a district called Palestine, and it had a capital. After that became a province within the Ottoman Empire, and was only the part that was admitted by Jerusalem that continued to be called Palestine. The northern part was part of the province of Syria and the province of Beirut. The coastal part, Beirut, the upper part was Syria. <laughs> Uh, you used the word, um, the notion, uh, sharecropper. Uh, I'm not too familiar with it. With it. Could you maybe briefly uh, explain or elaborate on it? Sure, yes. Uh, Shore cropping, sharecropping, sometimes called crop sharing. So both words are used. The British use crop sharing. The Americans use sharecropping. Uh, meaning that Peasants alienated from land or farmers crop the land for the landlord in return for a share of the crop. So the landlord would own, say, um, X number of dunums and would provide the seeds and sometimes water and sometimes the instrument of cultivation. The sharecropper and the family of the sharecropper would provide the labor. Sometimes crop sharing is a partnership with the landlord, meaning that the seeds and the tools are provided by the peasant. And this is called, in Arabic, muzara. Muzara, which means uh, co-cultivation. Co-cultivation is different from sharecropping in the sense that quite often, if it involves arbor, if, more planting trees, the, the peasant would actually acquire half the land after six, seven, eight, or 10 years. So continued co-cultivation means that the peasant would get half the land from the landlord against his own labor. Yeah, he would, he would actually own it. It would be registered in his name. Uh, this happened a lot in, uh, after 48 when many Palestinian peasants lost their land from the coastal region went inland. So they became co-cultivators with farmers from Jenin, Tulkarim, Nablus. Uh, and there was substantially more land there and many uh, farmers did not have the manpower to run it. So, and sometimes for for solidarity reasons, they co-cultivated the land with farmers who lost their land. So a lot of farmers, actually from refugees from Palestine 48, became co-owners as a result of these contracts. I, I have a question about the ruling again. I, are there uh, more circumstances about uh, why the Palestinian judges uh, made a ruling against Palestinian uh, peasants, unless I misunderstood something? The ruling that you uh, talked sorry, about. I did not understand. 
you you talked about the ruling uh, against the Palestinian peasants and the, uh, taking over the land by the German yes. uh, banker family. Uh, what were the circumstances of making that decision? Because you said that it was the Palestinian judges that made that ruling, ah, right? Why did they give them a, yeah. a lower sentence? Uh, no, because I, why did they decide that the banker family had the right to take over the land? Or did I misunderstand? Ah, yes, because the contract was clear. But the didn't you say that the peasants didn't really understand the contract? Yes, yes. Uh, actually, let me explain. Uh, it's, a, it's a very important question. Uh, in the 1870s, which is when the land was accrued to the Bergheim family, he, they killed him in, in 1891. So in the 1870s, the Bergheim signed a contract with the farmers covering the overdue taxes the farmers had to the government. Uh, the land by that time had been privatized, meaning the farmers actually owned the land by um, title deed. And, but they had, and this was the purpose of the land law of 1858, is to make the land taxable directly to the government, not through the landlords. So the logic of the land was acquisition of direct property deeds by the farmers. This was the logic of it. But the number of taxes increased. They no longer paid taxes through the landlords as before. They had to pay the taxes directly. So by the end of the 1870s, the amount of taxes was much more than the villagers can afford. Bergheim was a banking family based in Jerusalem. They signed a contract with the farmers that they will cover the back taxes in return for the farmers signing a very substantial amount of land in their name, which would accrue three or four or five years, I forgot. Five years later, the farmers could not repay and they had to forsake the land. The most of the farmers did not understand how a banker who pays their taxes, they think of the banker as a former landlord. How the banker can actually take possession of the land, they thought they were indebted to the banking firm. They did not understand how the land actually is lost from their ownership. So they rebelled. I, I, I oversimplified the logic because some Farmers in, in um, Abu Shusha refused to sign this contract. And they got away with it, actually. But the majority of them lost the land. And when the court decided in their favor, they were acting according to the logic of the land law. Because the Ottomans were very keen at making land a commodity, <coughs> available for purchase. Because they can tax it more, and they can also encourage uh, foreign investments. They wanted uh, 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 Europeans to actually invest in the land because it would uh, reduce the Ottoman uh, land debt and so on. So they were actually interested in enterprising Europeans coming to invest and capitalizing the land. So that's how they lost their land and that's why they killed them also. They, they killed them out of rage. They also, there was an interesting sexual affair involved in the, of, of this woman, but I think it's a side issue. I think it was used as a red herring to reduce the amount of... Uh, my, my friend Maha, who is a great granddaughter of the killer, does not believe from uh, village uh, folklore, folk uh, uh, records, that the woman actually was sleeping with Bergheim. Uh, she was just a servant, and she was used, because I have the interrogation record of the women, and she is a, a person who led the killers to his movement. She knew when he would leave and come. So she was a woman who was involved in the killing, but it's not clear whether she actually was involved with him in any uh, quote-unquote moral uh, entrapment or not. Did I answer your question? Uh, yeah.
Maybe I answered more than your question. <laughs> I'm, I'm much more interested in uh, if you can explain to us how this informal court system went on in Palestine, because after the Ottoman, I mean, we had a sort of, it was all the time the lack of a state, actually, and in a way or in another, obliged Palestinian all the time to sort of find the informality of judging, and, and I would love, and, and especially this, for example, was very clear, at least during the first intifada. I mean, I had my grandfather that was almost performing as a judge, so there, where there was a problem in the city, they would come to him and he would accept, let's accept the case, and they would form a sort of a very traditional way of, uh, and I would love to have your historical reading on these sort of informal court uh, system and how you would see it. And uh, actually, I don't have a definitive answer because the, we don't have uh, proceedings from these courts. In the Intifada, we have a similar parallel to court, informal court judgments that operated in the 1930s using the political vacuum established by the withdrawal of the colonial state. But sometimes rebel leaders would impose revolutionary justice when they thought that the colonial authority or the peasants f believed that they had no redress from formal laws. So there was a combination of factors. One was the belief that they will not get redress from the official government court system. Two, it was a decision by rebel commanders that we want to challenge the authority of the state by resolving local disputes ourselves. So all we have is um, um, oral historical records. I, there may be written records, but I don't have them. And I think most of these courts were not dealt with through recordings. They actually made summary justice according to claims. So, and rebel commanders would administer the court justice. Sometimes they used legal people, but most of the cases, they were military commanders involved in them. In the first intifada, which you mentioned, it was slightly different in that they had traditional um, sheikhs who administered local justice uh, because uh, lawyers were on strike at that time, and sometimes the court itself went on strike, but mostly they also wanted to challenge the Israeli uh, legal system by uh, adju adjudication, adjudication, adjudication. Now, remember that this kind of adjudication exists today under the Palestinian Authority. And it existed before. Sometimes people resort to local uh, law resolution uh, independently of rebellion. It's not rebellion that is always the cause. During these rebellions, however, the military commanders were interested in challenging the court system of the state. But in all other times, these are local uh, proceedings. In, in fact, the Ottomans recognized uh, Mahakim Suluh, which is the lowest case of, uh, in English they call them uh, like conflict resolution courts, which are recognized by the state, but they are not run by judges. They are um, uh, courts which uh, resolve local disputes by consensuality by consensual agreement. Uh, they have a name for it, I forgot what it is. Um, in any case, so this court system existed. It, it, what is interesting about the, the revolution, the rebellion of 1936, is that they acted as if they were liberated territory. Whereas, and in the Intifada, I know uh, you probably know about, Beit Sahur was a very important center for the rebellion, but uh, Faisal Hussein administered some of these resolutions in the Jerusalem districts. They also had local 
resistance leaders administering these forms of justice. Uh, so they echoed what happened in 1936, but they also continued to operate in other periods. In uh, Ted Swedenborg's book, you will find references to them, but also in two new books, uh, also based on oral history, but not, there are no records for them. I mean, there may be records that I don't know where they are, but it's interesting to compare them. Um, I, I'd like to get back to the to the start of the rebellion in '36. Um, it says that in 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 the in the records it says that the 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 strike the general strike in '36 started on the 20th of April, but that the Arab High Council declared it on the 25th of April. So this discrepancy I think is very interesting, and I've, I'm kind of wondering what you know. Why is there this discrepancy? Who declared that there is going to be a strike that is not the Arab High Council? And who, who exactly was it that started this rebellion that, uh, that started? That's a very interesting issue. Uh, the 36 rebellion actually was a contested territory between the leadership of the Arab High Council under the command of Hajami al-Husseini and local bands. Uh, many of them sympathize or followers of Azadine Qassam. Qassam was murdered or at, uh, killed by the British in 1935, one year before the rebellion. And his militancy was always a source of irritation to the national leadership. And many radical elements, especially in rural areas, paid allegiance to Qassam, sometimes against uh, uh, Hajj Amin. So the declaration of the strike uh, became a contested issue between those who counseled moderation, that is a negotiated settlement with the British, and those who thought that they should uh, have war against the British until the British fulfill major demands by the rebellion, especially on the issue of uh, Jewish immigration to Palestine. So the discrepancy had to do with this residual uh, forces of Azadine Qassam, and sometimes not related to him, and the official leadership of the Arab uh, Higher Council by Hajj Lamin. If I may continue, um, so m those leaders were basically peasants, right? So, or, and, or not all of them were peasants. Or lower castes or classes. So I wonder, I've been wondering if, if and what type of connections these peasants had outside of the Palestinian area. Because obviously when you look at the timeline, you see that in 1840, 18, 1891, the Tsar was killed in, in Russia. So this was an immense movement for the Zionists. Zionists decided basically then and there to get out. And of course, Palestine was one of these places where they wanted to go. So I've been this this movement, and, and of course the Syrian uh, Syrian independence in '35, and these there must have been some type of movement of information within the peasantry that that caused. I mean, Qassam himself, Isaldin, was from Syria. So this these movements, this information must have been flowing within the peasantry and the oral folk tradition. And I wonder if there is somehow some way of getting towards this knowledge of where do these things come from and how did they move around within that uh, region? Yes, it's important to remember in 1936 that Palestine was an uh, autonomous region only for, for 20 years, 18 years. Before that, it was part of a larger uh, Arab provinces of Syria. And people actually did not recognize the border uh, between, the Jordan was not actually a, a border until 1918 uh, between Transjordan and the colonial state of Palestine under the British. The Lebanese border uh, and the Syrian border divided communities. The, the culture of southern Lebanon and northern Palestine 
is closer than the culture between northern Palestine and southern Palestine. So people shared the same region with new colonial boundaries crisscrossing it. And in the rebellion, a lot of the commanders and fighters actually were Lebanese and Syrians. Kowakji was Syrian, as Din Qassam was Syrian. The whole Varantil's force of the uh, Arab Liberation Party, which came from the north, were 80% Syrian and Lebanese. A lot of Druze was among them. And it's interesting that the Druze of Palestine were divided. Many of them collaborated with the, with the Zionists before 48. So Palestine was part of the larger Syrian region. It had its own distinct uh, cultural practices, cuisine and dialect and so on, but a lot of overlap with these other regions. And political sentiments cut across these the regions in, in a very distinct way. Is this what you're referring to? In a way, I, I'm... So for me, um, I've, I've always been... I've been interested in the strike for quite a long time, and I don't quite understand how the concept of the strike arrived in Palestine. So this, this modernist idea of, of stopping labor, of stopping factories, of stopping these in order to impact the economy, how did this arrive in Palestine? Where did it come from? I mean, the first strikes, I mean, 18th, 19th century was full of strikes. 35 had strikes in America, in Australia. All of Australia striked. All the ships stopped what year? work. What year? In 35. Well, there was the Arbagia strike in Alexandria and Cairo, hmm. 1909. 1909, exactly. that's much earlier. No, no, but that's what I mean. These, these strikes were continuous for a very long period until, uh, I mean, for me, this, the idea of the strike connects Palestine within a much broader con a global context against imperialism. Yeah. So this is why I'm like... So what are you very, saying? What are you saying? I, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm trying to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> the notion of a strike actually did exist earlier. I mean, we know from Greek literature that women st struck or... What's the essence of strike? Struck against sleeping with their husbands from the... Uh, <laughs> from the Peloponnesian Wars. Yeah, but this is not economic strike. I mean, I mean economic strike. <laughs> ah, this I, I, is for sexual, example, in eight, yeah. 18, 1819 in South Africa, they were, they were doing strikes. So the strikes, and then in 1825, you go to 1840s, 1870s, in Russia, all yeah. over the world, strikes were happening, and, and also in the Middle East. Yeah. Strikes, 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 strikes. Mm. So I'm, for me, it's really it, the, the question of how the peasantry is connected globally is very interesting a problem or a question. And I wonder if you would know something about this, or if there is I a way you you should do this, something. your project, for the next... Uh, for the <laughs> resistance, <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I have a question. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask, um, why did you uh, use this very specific case in court? Because I, I believe that there is a reason behind why did, is it like symbolic for uh, many other cases, cases which happened the same way, or was it the first one which uh, kind of symbolizes the way of how the land was acquired? Actually, the answer is very simple. It's the only case I could find in the 19th century where you have such a wealth of uh, uh, police interrogation records, uh, district attorney, charge sheets, detailed court records. I should tell you a, a secret. Um, this extensive, I mean, I have like 600 pages in interrogation, court records, land dealings. It has to do with the uh, German uh, consular services. 
Because it involved the German citizens, they were able to press on the Ottomans to make available to them the interrogation records. And the interrogations are so extensive and so exciting to read. There's nothing like it. There's no other case for Palestine. I, maybe in, in Syria, definitely in Anatolia, you will find similar cases, court cases. But in Palestine, it's the only one I could find. Thank you. That's enough. <laughs> Thank you a lot.